You may be seated. The Lord is certainly our defense. Amen. As we open God's word, I pray that this morning we would taste and see that the Lord is good, especially as we come to a section of God's word that's centered all around bread this morning. So may we taste and see God's goodness as we come to his word. In Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to flip open to there. As we've been continuing through the gospel according to Mark this morning, we come to this glorious section of scripture. Now as we've been working through Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus now commit so many miraculous, incredible works according to the purpose of his kingdom and the purpose of his mission during his incarnation here on earth. He has cast out demons both of members of Israel and then as we saw last week of the Gentiles as well. He has healed the sick both within the nation of Israel as well as the Gentile nations. He has fed the 5,000 with fishes and loaves, particularly within the nation of Israel, and that will be relevant to what we see him do this morning in God's word. And as he does this, he will use um, this contrast, um, or as he goes through God's word and is doing these incredible miracles, we see that he's continuing to do these pairs or these repeated miracles, but he's doing them with different groups in order to prove a purpose. And as we'll see, he fed the 5,000. We get to God's word today, he'll feed the 4,000, but it's this pairing that we've seen throughout. But as he feeds these 4,000 and from these Gentiles, we're going to see a contrast as well between the faithfulness um, of him with the faithfulness or faithlessness of the Pharisees and King Herod and the forgetfulness of his disciples. If you're able, stand with me for the reading of God's word as we look at Mark chapter one, or chapter 8, verse 1 through 21. Let's hear God's word for us. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples and set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said to them, these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Damutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another in the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You may be seated and join me in prayer. Lord, I pray that as we come before you in your word this morning, that we would taste and behold and be satisfied with the glorious gift of the bread of heaven which was sent down for us, Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you see the glory of what you're seeking to reveal in this text, not only in your miraculous work, but also in your rebuke to the Pharisees and also your reminder to the disciples. Lord, as we consider these things, would we take account of them and would, by your spirit, you instruct us to follow you more faithfully and to be more satisfied in you as we remember the glorious works you have done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we're going to work through this section of Scripture this morning, we're going to break it into three chunks as we consider what God has revealed to us here. The first is we'll consider the bread of the world in verses 1 through 9. And then in verses 10 through 15, we'll consider the corrupt leaven, this leaven that the disciples were warned to be aware of. And finally, we will consider the forgetful followers in verses 16 through 21. Let's begin by considering this bread of the world in verses 1 through 9. Now, it's important to remember here in Mark's ordering of his gospel and how he's telling the glories of what Christ has done, that this flows right from the narrative at the end of Mark chapter 7, where Jesus is performing particularly healings and casting out demons of the Gentile people. Just as Jesus repeated past miracles to Gentile audiences, then it moves right into this text where we see him again complete a miracle that is familiar to us, the miraculous feeding with fish and loaves of this large crowd of people, but it's to a different audience this time. It's to a Gentile audience. So keep that in mind as we reread these first nine verses. What does it say? It says, in those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. No, it's coming from far away, from these Gentile lands, to hear what he has to say. His disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? You'd think they'd know the answer to that by now. But verse 5, and he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. They had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that they should also be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. Well, certainly as we work through this text, there's so much of it that should ring familiar to last time that he fed a large crowd of people. It opens by the cause of this saying that he had compassion on them, which is the exact phrase and the exact instance that happened last time he fed a large group of people. His disciples saw the practical necessity of feeding all these people and said, oh, we won't be able to do that. But what Jesus was motivated by is he had compassion on these people that were in front of him. It's important for us to see here that the same love that compelled Christ to feed the multitudes of Israel inspires him to go on to feed the multitudes of the Gentiles. Do you think that the chief shepherd cares for his sheep? He certainly does. There's wolves that will seek to come and destroy them, and he will guard them. He will lead them to green pastures, as here he leads them to the grass and where to sit. He binds up the broken, and he hears the needs of hungry sheep, and he desires to feed them. There's some glorious implications from this that in one sense it would be easy to read right over because, again, it's so familiar. 
but should be striking to us because the illustration that was true last time, as Jesus, this great compassionate shepherd, was feeding the sheep, he was doing this to a flock of Israelites. But now it's a flock of Gentiles, and he's feeding those sheep as well. What's the implication of this? The Gentiles are being welcomed into the flock of God. They have been brought in through the sheep gate of Christ Jesus, the Lord. It's glorious that Christ here is having this compassion to feed these people. His disciples ask him a pragmatic question, but I think it's actually one rich with symbolism. As he has compassion on them and wants to feed them, they ask, how can you feed people in this desolate place? How can you feed people in this desolate place? Well, in one sense, you're just almost frustrated as you read the question, aren't you? Don't you remember he's done this sort of thing before? And certainly he did with the feeding of the 5,000. Was that the only time God has fed people in a desolate place before? What about with Israel? During the Exodus, as God led the people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea and into the desert, and all these great crowds of people are wanting to run back to Egypt so they can have food and security again, what did God do to this people wandering in the desert? He fed them, didn't he? These people in a desolate desert place, God fed them. And what did he feed them? He fed them the manna, right? The bread from heaven. Just as God redeemed Israel from their captivity and then fed them, so now is Jesus redeeming the Gentiles and feeding them. It's a glorious picture. And this image, if, if it seems abstract in John's gospel, becomes explicit to us. Listen to what it says in John chapter 6, verse 31 through 33. It says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. At his, it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That symbol of God feeding his people in the desert in the Old Testament is seen in a supreme way as Jesus now during his ministry is coming to those in the desolate place who are coming unto him from faraway lands in faith, and he is feeding them. I don't think that's the only significant thing that we see in these texts. I also think there's a clearly symbolic issue going on as a particular number is repeated over and over again. And that is the number seven that runs through these first few verses. He asked of his disciples, how many loaves do you have? To which their answer was seven. Notice, does he ever ask them how many fish they have? No, in fact, when it gets to the fish, it's like, ah, there was some fish. The numbers are, seems utterly irrelevant to the telling of the story. Even the last time around, it was very specific of how many were each. But here in this telling of this feeding, number's not important. What's important is the number of loaves, right? And then it says, in case we miss it, not just that he took the bread, it says he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them, right? It says they had a few small fish, but the loaves, that's what was significant. And as they took up the broken pieces left over, how many baskets were left? Seven, right? So three times this reiteration of the significance of seven, seven, seven. Well, there's a few things we have to get from this. First is whenever you see repetition as you're studying the Bible, that shows emphasis, Okay, as they're writing in Greek, they wouldn't put an exclamation mark. That's not something they had in their language. If they wanted to emphasize a point, they would utilize repetition. So when you see that repetition of something, that should clue you in, that, that's, that a point is trying to be made, that that should grab a hold of us. Just like when the angels declare that God is holy, 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 right? It's an emphasis on his holiness. This thrice holy, and particularly when stated three times, that's like the all caps, bold, exclamation point, okay? That's in their way of writing. That's like the supreme way to make a point is to say it three times. Well, three times in this text we're given seven, seven, seven. Well, what's the significance of this? Well, seven is an incredibly symbolic um, 
number throughout the scriptures. Most chiefly, we see in the creation account, right? That God created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh day. That seventh day being a symbol of completed work. And throughout the scripture, seven, time and time again, is this glorious picture of completion. This shouldn't surprise us that when you get to the book of Revelation, it's sevens all over the place as you get to the completed work of God's consummated kingdom. There's seven churches and seven lampstands and seven seals and seven angels and seven plagues, right? That number just runs over and over and over again in the book of Revelation. Why? Because it's a symbolic number of completion. And here, what's the significance of that? That as God is feeding these Gentiles the bread from heaven, I think here the emphasis is glorious that the symbolism of seven is pointing that Jesus' work of feeding is symbolically finished. He has finished this task and that his feeding, his bread, is now going to all people, right? It's not just contained within one group of people, but it is going to the world. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. And those are coming to him from all over, and he is glad to be feeding them. I want to ask you, saints, whose bread have you been eating? Whose bread have you been eating? Jesus, the bread sent down from heaven, the great manna who would feed us so that we would never hunger again, has been sent to all people. None of us have an excuse. His proclamation has gone to all. He is willing, a good shepherd, willing to bring anyone into his flock if they would come through the sheep gate of Christ. He is offering us his food. Are you hungry? Have you eaten it? The world's bread will always leave you hungry. It will draw you in by your carnal appetites, but it will never satisfy them. Have you noticed this before? The world likes to appeal to our natural appetites, but it never satisfies them. Have you ever thought, I'll just have a little dabble in sin, and that'll whet my appetite, and then I'll be glad to move on from it? It never works, does it? Only leaves you hungrier than when you first started. It only gives you a greater hunger for the things of this world, but it never fills them. This is not the case, though. This is not how it works with Christ and the bread he's offering. Yet the bread of this world is not our only choice, is it? We have the daily bread of life, and we are free to partake of it. God has shown compassion on us. Do you see this? That compassion of Jesus to feed his sheep is the compassion he's shown to us and to the world. It's a glorious reality. Would we turn from our worldly appetites and feast on the finished meal of our Savior? May we hunger no more. A glorious picture of this bread of heaven coming to the people. But in this text, you're not left there for long before you see the conflict arise in the false breads and the competing breads of this world and how they seek to corrupt things, which leads to the corrupt leaven in verses 10 through 15. All bread is not created equal. Some is nutritious and filling and hearty, and other is moldy and stale and good only for the dogs and the scavengers, right? Note how the narrative continues this bread theme as we move on to discussing the corrupt leaven in contrast to the bread from heaven. It says in verse 10, and immediately, Mark's favorite word there, immediately, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Now, the exact location here is uncertain. Um, Different people will debate different spots they think that this location is. But he probably leaves at this point the region of the Decapolis, the more Gentile territory, is moving back into the territory of Israel here in verse 10. That's likely the case, although, again, the exact location is debated. Now, it goes on in verse 11 to say, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. He said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, 
and went to the other side. Immediately, as he moves to this new region, this new town, he comes into this confrontation with those who are immediately demanding of him a miracle. Now note the difference between this and some of the encounters of miracles he just had to a, a woman who came up completely willing to humble herself for the sake of spiritual healing for her daughter. Those who are coming to him in faith, believing that even if we can just touch the hem of his garment, we will be healed. Are those who are just there to follow him, even if it would lead them destitute and hungry, but they just want to do anything to receive his teaching. He has compassion on them and healing them. Notice the context of all those miracles that he had just gone through. And this time he rolls into town and they're like, oh, the circus is here. Will you do a trick for us? That's how they're treating him. You, you, oh, you say you can do all his miracles. Let's see one. Very different context, isn't it? It's not that Jesus is unwilling to do the miraculous out of his compassion and for the sake of his kingdom. They should not be treated as some sort of circus pony, which here he seems to be put up as by these Pharisees. They come and want to argue with Christ and request a sign from heaven in order to test him. Now Jesus is certainly willing to show these signs, isn't he? But it's worthwhile to point out at this point in Jesus' ministry, we're not at the very beginning of it. Jesus is quite a public figure. We see this by even the fact when he leaves Israel, crowds rush to him because they've heard news of his miracles. Are the Pharisees here ignorant of the fact that he can heal? Was this people coming to him saying, I, I wonder if the hype's true? No, they know he can heal. Many of them who are coming to him and bringing these accusations have probably been present for some of these healings at this point. He was not an obscure figure. He was not an unknown figure. And his works had very much been testified to these people. They knew he could heal. They had seen it. And what does God's word tell us in Deuteronomy 6, 16? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. This is the verse that Jesus quotes while being tempted by the devil in the desert. It's an important parallel here that the devil thought it was fitting to try to test God and to make him show himself and to perform these signs and miracles. And Jesus resisted that. So who are the Pharisees acting like in, in this example? Showing themselves very similarly like the devil, trying to put God to the test. Jesus was capable, but he is unwilling to play their cynical games. And thus he moves on. He departs from them. This is what it goes on to say in verses 14 and 15. It says, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So what is Jesus doing now here with his disciples? He's giving them a warning. He's saying, Don't be like those we just encountered. Beware! Watch out. And why is he saying this? What illustration does he use? He uses the illustration of leaven, which should not be surprising in all the bread talk that's been going on in all of this. He's trying to connect dots for them, help them to understand. For, for those of you who don't understand baking very well, and I'd put myself in that category. My wife is a far better baker than I am. But it's and easy enough to understand what leaven does and that it spreads and it expands and it causes bread to rise. If you add leaven to dough, it's not something that can merely be picked out. It's not as if a raisin were to fall into the dough and you could dig around and find that raisin and remove it, right? You insert leaven into the dough and what happens? permeates the whole lump, right? This is what leaven does. And this is the illustration that he uses to be aware of as it pertains to the Pharisees and as well as King Herod. When mixed in the dough, you cannot extract it. But what is this leaven exactly with the Pharisees and King Herod he's talking about? I think Matthew Henry says it well in his commentary explaining what's going on here. He says, the Pharisees demanded a sign from heaven, and Herod was long desirous to see some miracle wrought by Christ, such as he would prescribe, so that the leaven of both was the same, 
They were unsatisfied with the signs they had and would have others of their own devising. Take heed from this leaven, saith Christ. Be convinced by the miracles ye have seen and covet not to see more. They're never satisfied. They always needed another one, another proof, another sign, another demonstration, and one that fits their own desires and agendas, right? They're not satisfied with what they have, but they want more. And that's what Jesus is warning them of here. I think Matthew Henry summarizes that well. I want to ask you in your own example of your own life as other people you know or maybe yourself, how many today seek a sign or a miracle to justify their faith? If I could only see this external act, then I would believe, right? This can go in all kinds of different ways, but people incessantly have this desire for new revelation. Lord, I will be obedient to follow you. If you will just give me a sign, if you'll cause this light to change as I'm sitting here, uh, when I count to it, then I'll follow you. In three, two, one and a half, right? One, right? And and then it doesn't turn green. And all right, I'm going to start over again, right? And they do this sort of thing, right? Where they just want this external sign. If God will just give me that, then I'll have faith. Oh, Lord, I will commit to follow you. If you'll just perform this healing, if you'll just help me land this job, then I'll start taking church seriously. If you'll just heal this relationship, God, then I will take you seriously, right? All examples of people just treating God like this trick. If you'll just show me this sign, then I'll take you seriously. I want to tell you, saints, that if you're guilty of this sort of thing, if you try to treat God in this transactional sort of way, you're in grave error. You're treating God in such a way that you just want what he can produce for you, and you're putting him to the test. The Lord certainly does miraculous things, but he is not a circus entertainer. And if you treat him that way, you are gravely disrespecting the God of heaven and earth. Much more, we have received the finished revelation of his miraculous works. You want to see God work miracles? Open your Bible. He's given us testimony after testimony of the miraculous works he has done. We have so many examples given to us. And faith is trusting not in the things we see, but in the things we can't see. We have given signs of his wonderful work. We don't need to see them with our own eyes in order to believe them. In fact, how many people saw them with their own eyes, yet were still faithless in his own day? If you have that sort of thinking, you should not be comforted from this. Because as you look to them, you have to realize, I might have been in their camp. If I'm just looking for a physical sign and I get one, maybe I still won't believe and just want another one and endlessly have an appetite for these sorts of things. We must be careful of this. We also must be on guard by just looking to physical things in this world and thinking that that's our standard of truth rather than what God has revealed in his word. Consider how in Egypt, the false magicians were able to conjure up some of the miracles that were done as God was sending out the plagues. Sometimes those who do quote-unquote miraculous signs are not on God's team. We shouldn't trust in just what we can see and discern with our own eyes. We have to discern what God has spoken in his word. May we seek the Savior and not the signs. May we not begin to worship the gifts more than the giver, as we are often prone to do. We should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, as we're told here. Which leads to the final point, and one that I will say is probably the most convicting as I studied this passage of Scripture, and one that I think if we're honest is one that all of us are all too prone to commit. On the one hand, you have the Pharisees who were never satisfied or compared by the miracles they saw Jesus do. But on the other hand, you have disciples who have seen them, yet seem to be unable to remember them. They forget the works Jesus has continued to do. Listen to what it says beginning in verse 16. They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, 
Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12, which was their number, the feast they got to enjoy. Said unto the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, seven. He said to them, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? How quickly do the cares of this world take our eyes off of our Savior? We see his wonderful works. We see his miraculous power. And then we get hungry. And all that past faithfulness, all that past work he's done, swept away. They were hungry. And their thoughts could only think about the fact that they didn't have enough food in the boat. I think the most pointed question, Jesus lays into them all kinds of pointed questions here. But the final one, I think, is really the kicker that should sink in and resonate with us. He says, do you not remember? Do you not remember? Have you forgotten? How quickly have we forgotten? How quickly have you and I forgotten over and over and over again? What does Jesus do here? Does he instantly multiply more loaves and just give them to his disciples? Oh, you guys forgot. Here's some more. Be fed. No, he lets them sit in these questions, doesn't he? He lets the weight of his words serve as that rebuke that they needed to marinate in for a while. And his rebuke was really a reminder of his previous works. His rebuke was a reminder, do you remember what I've done? Again, have you forgotten? Let me remind you. Oh, wait, we're answering, oh, it was uh, 12. Oh, it was uh, a 7. Oh, you do remember. Good. That's your hope. That's what you need to be satisfied. You need to remember the works that I have done. One of the chief sins of the people of God, both old and new, is we forget. Time and time again in God's law, instructions are given in such specific detail that they would go through particular ordinances and particular practices and particular rituals so that they and their children would not forget the works that God had done. Yet time and time again, as you read the Old Testament, Generation after generation, the people forget what God has done. I don't think most Christians have wrestled with the grave danger to our souls and to our Christian lives that comes when we forget. Because we just assume we're not going to forget. And that's why we read these sorts of texts and our first thought is, you dumb disciples, why are you so hard-hearted? Jesus is right to rebuke you. We forget how quickly we fall into the same pattern. One of the glories of singing the Psalms is they're filled with testimonies of what God has done previously. It should be part of our worship as saints is to remember what God has already done. Not merely asking, Lord, what will you continue to do? But rooting ourselves in what God has done, his finished work. As I look into the boat and consider these disciples, I don't look down on them if I'm honest. I see myself in the boat. How quickly do I forget the good works God has done for me? How many times have we as a family been out of money or stressed out or uncertain about what our future would be? And the Lord has provided for us. But then that next trial comes And I'm just thrown in that same anxiety as if he had never worked through one of these problems before. How quick am I to forget? So many examples I could give of this. One that sticks out in my mind in a clear way 
as we were trying to get out of some of our school debt early on in the marriage, and we were going through the Dave Ramsey thing, trying to go through the sna- d- s- debt snowball and all that, and trying to clear out all this debt that we had accumulated. And so in the process, we sold our house, and we were just living in this little condo to try to accomplish this. And we made it to the end of the month, um, one of those months, and we had already thrown a bunch of money at debt that month. And we were just out of money. We were broke. There's nothing left. Hadn't built up a savings yet because we were just in that phase of trying to get out from under us. And we were basically out of food. And an elder from our church calls, not knowing any of this, completely unaware of the situation we were in, said, hey, uh, we're, we're starting a new diet. And basically everything in our pantry and our freezer, we can't eat. And so would you be okay if we just came by and dropped it off for you? Yeah, that would actually be phenomenal, right? I I share that story, and if I was more thoughtful, if I was better at remembering, I could probably share thousands, right? But how quick am I to forget? I don't know if you've been following the Lord for any length of time, but I'm sure, sure if you have, there should be testimony after testimony after testimony of things that the Lord has done in your life. Yet when those moments of trial come up, do they come to mind? Or do you forget? Are you just like the disciples in the boat? We only have one loaf. What are we going to do? Are you going to trust in the Lord? Are you going to remember the good works he has done, not only for you, but the promises he's declared in his word? Or are you going to forget? These times are going to come up over and over again, saints. You're going to face so many trials whether it be job transitions, whether it be health problems, whether it be national politics, maybe you're entering into this election cycle this year and you're just so worried about what's going to happen. Are you willing to remember God's faithfulness to you during all those trials? Are you willing to remember that he's a God who keeps his covenant and never fails to complete his promises? Are you going to remember that he's a God who never forgets even when you do? Are you going to remember God's faithfulness to you and the promises he has made to you in his word? God has given you promises, saints. Now, does he promise us a better paying job? No, he doesn't promise us that. Does he promise us physical health? No, he doesn't give us that promise. But he is a good shepherd, and he will take care of the needs of his sheep. We can trust him in every circumstance. We can look to the glorious pastures that do await us for us who are in Christ. That he will lead us through whatever dark valleys. He will be our guide in them. We can stand on his promises that he will keep us and he will sustain us, and that he is working all things for his glory and for our good. If we are in him, that is a promise that he's given to us. Do you remember that promise when you're in the boat and hungry? Can we stand on the promises of our future hope of heaven and glorification that await us? That our God will not only save us once in our moment of justification, but that he will carry us all the way to glorification? That we are held in both the Father's and the Son's hand and he will never let us go? Are those sure promises that we have? They are. Are we going to remember them? Can we trust that every enemy of Christ will be defeated and every curse and pain of sin will be destroyed by our Lord who is ruling and reigning? It's a sure promise of his word, saints. But will we forget? Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember. And so I encourage you, as you read a text like this, be humble. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't just look at them as the dumb disciples who can't quite figure it out. Be encouraged by our need to remember and the great temptation it is to forget. Would you pray with me? Oh God, as we come before you, We pray that you give us this day our daily bread. Help us to eat of you and be satisfied. 
Help us to find our comfort in your promises and in your work. Lord, you have given us no shortage of testimonies of your glory. Your gospel is sweet. Your work of redemption revealed to us in the scriptures and for us who have been following you in our own lives are so many, God. And Lord, we just confess we're quick to forget those things. So Lord, help us to remember. Help us to find our comfort in what you've done and what your word says you will do as the faithful covenant-keeping God. You are the good shepherd. You do feed your sheep. But may we beware of the unfruitful leaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.